Right, go ahead if you would and please open up to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John will be in chapter 17 today. We'll be finishing it off. John chapter 17. This morning, as we uh, finish out this chapter, we'll be in verses 20 through 26, and we're going to specifically be speaking about uh, the glory that Christ has given um, to us. But before we get into it, here um, we're closing out the third section of what is considered Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17. And again, I just want you to recall for a moment how once a year the Jewish high priest would specifically pray for the children of Israel on the Day of Atonement or this Jewish festival called Yom Kippur. And on this day, he would say a specific prayer where he would intercede for himself first, then he would intercede for um, his family, and then he would intercede for the nation of Israel. And Jesus, again, follows this exact same pattern as he prays in verses 1 through 5. He prays for himself, then he prays for his disciples, meaning the eleven. And then he prayed for all believers, which is the section that we're going to be in here together today. So with that being said, I would love it if you would just close your eyes. And uh, I'm going to let Jesus pray for us today. We'll read his words. and You can just listen to the voice of Jesus Christ as he prays for you. Verses 20 through 26. Jesus prayed to his father and he said, I don't ask for these only but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them even as you've loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world doesn't know you, I know you, and these know that you've sent me. I made known to them your name, I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. In Jesus' name, we let him pray for us. Amen. So here in verse 20, Jesus continued praying here and he said, I don't ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Now, this particular verse is so incredible that it ought to take your breath away if you're paying attention. This proves uh, that you and I were on Christ's heart as He's praying just before going to the cross on our behalf. Jesus' prayer wasn't just for Himself. It wasn't just for his closest friends in the moment. According to what we're reading right now, Jesus Christ prayed for you. He prayed for me. He prayed for all of those who have believed since he returned to the Father, and he's praying also for all those who have yet to believe until he comes again. But he's praying for you. You we're on the mind of Almighty God. That ought to leave you a bit speechless. We are near to the heart of Jesus Christ the Lord. God is not only thinking about humanity in general, He is thinking specifically about you as well. Now, while he's making sure the sun orbits or the earth orbits the sun perfectly, 
while he's making sure whales are migrating as they need to in the ocean, while he's holding the atomic matter of the universe together, he's thinking about you. It's amazing. Also, this mention of us in His prayer, in Christ's prayer, isn't a one-off. It's not a one-time event. He is still interceding for us. I ask somebody for Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Jesus Christ, not just here in John 17, but Jesus Christ, we just read it, is still doing what? Interceding. And that's in this present continual sense. He's not interceding occasionally, every once in a while, every decade or so. He's interceding for you and for me right now. Oh, wait a second. He's interceding for you and me right now. Let's give it an hour. He's interceding for you then. He lives to make intercession for you. He's interceding for you. I asked uh, Katie, I think, for Hebrews 7.25. Jesus always lives, according to Scripture, to do what? He's interceding for you. Not all the way back just in John 17. He's interceding for us right now. James, right now, Jesus intercedes for you. Robert, Jesus right now is interceding for you. Cabela, Jesus is interceding for you. For you, Maureen, Jesus is interceding for you right now. Almighty God, you're on the heart and the mind of Almighty God, and He's praying for you. That's nuts. Be a good thing if you just camped out on that this week and meditated on that, pondered that. How? He's saying He's praying for us. And He's saying He's praying for those who will believe in Him through the words of His disciples. So how have we come to believe in Jesus? Is it not just as Jesus said it would be? We have received Jesus' word through the testimony of through the witness of His disciples. Men like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they painstakingly wrote down and preserved the words of Christ for us so we could have it. Peter, Paul, uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus, they wrote letters to expound on the words of Christ so that we might fully understand what Jesus is saying. They set out, the disciples simply set out to obey what Jesus commanded them to do, and He commands us to do the same thing in the Great Commission, where Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you, even until the end of the age. So they're faithful to do what Christ commanded. And we, just as Jesus prayed, are the beneficiaries of their obedience. Paul, when he's writing to the believers in Rome, in uh, Romans chapter 10 said, How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in Him in whom they have never heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? And then he said, How are they to preach unless they're sent? As it's written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of Jesus to other people who do not yet know. The disciples were faithful to do that. 
Now, I'm not going to say this in a cocky way because I know that I'm a sinner saved by grace. But right now, according to scripture, how does God feel about my feet as I stand here before you? He looks at my feet and he goes, man, those are some nice looking feet. Right? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news to other people? Listen, as you go out, which you're called to do by Christ, if you've placed your faith in him and you're sharing Jesus with a friend face to face or over a text message or over social media or whatever. What does God think about your feet? Come on. What is, yeah, he looks at your feet and he goes, wow, look at those feet. We have come to believe the truth because the disciples were faithful to do just as Jesus prayed that they would. We would have never heard if they weren't faithful to share the good news. Jesus used them to preserve and share this good news, this gospel with us. Now, we're the disciples of Christ as well, and he wants us to simply follow in their footsteps and share his word with the next generations until he comes again, so that they too might come to believe through our word, through our testimony of, hey, this is what Jesus has done for me. Verse 21 Jesus continued and he prayed that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you and that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. First of all, Jesus here is praying for this idea of unity. So Jesus then does not want us, he does not want us to isolate ourselves and hide our faith behind closed doors. No, instead, he saved us so that we can begin, according to Jesus, begin to live in relational unity. And he wants us to live in a healthy relationship with him and with other people. Now, why in the world would God be so determined and so desirous of us to live in unity? Jesus desires unity for us so that we can experience just a small taste of what he has always had with his father and what he has always had with the Holy Spirit. The Bible speaks of a God, right? Who is, there is one God and yet he's three in one. And he exists in perfect relational unity all the time. And he wants us to simply have a taste of that. Now, verse 22, fasten your seatbelts. If you um, have a Bible, you need to, I, want, I want you to utilize turning in your Bible with us today. So if that's on your phone, that's groovy. I can, I can handle that. However, it, your phones do uh, present additional distractions with text messages and alerts from other apps and everything else. If you've got a paper Bible, go ahead and open it up. If you don't, open up your U version or whatever it is on your phone because we're going to do this together. Okay, so... This is not sit around and just listen. I want this to be interactive, right? Verse 22, Jesus prayed, The glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, even as we are one. Now, I'm going to attempt to be rather transparent with you today. Uh, This verse, when I was just reading through it this week, thinking about what are we going to, how are we going to approach this section of scripture? I read this verse and it pretty much stumped me because uh, as we've already discussed back in verse five, uh, Jesus has already prayed uh, for his desire to return to the glory that he had before he ever came to the earth, right? And here he's praying, I've given them the same glory that the father has given to me, right? This is a really Strange thing, if we begin to think about it. Verse 5, if you go back in John 17, Jesus prayed, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Well, then a few weeks ago, we read in Revelation chapter 1, where John has a vision of Jesus in his glorified estate that he prayed that he would receive. And he certainly doesn't look anything like the hippie Jesus that we uh, see pictures of. So then what in the world could Jesus possibly mean here in verse 22 that he has given us 
Just pause to think about what we just read. He said he has given us the same kind of glory. So I honestly had no idea. I was reading that. I was like, There's, that's weird. Last week, uh, in our time together, we were discussing the importance of God's word and how it is he desires to have his word at work in our life. And we talked about the importance of studying God's word um, for ourselves and simply asking the Holy Spirit to just reveal the truth of God's word to us and then be intentional to just sit down and start studying. And as we study, as we talked last week, the word of God sanctifies us. It makes us more like Christ and we grow in spiritual maturity over time if we'll just simply do it. So to demonstrate this morning, I just want to explain how I personally went about trying to understand what in the world did Jesus mean when he said, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. Well, what could that possibly mean? First of all, this phrase caught my attention. Um, it certainly seems way more significant than just some passing comment that Jesus prayed while he's praying. Uh, Jesus never wasted any of his words. Everything he prayed, he prayed on purpose. So it caused me to just stop personally and pray. What in the world did you mean? Uh, I know that on my own, I cannot discern the true meaning of Scripture for myself. I need help. Okay? But I have a helper, the Bible says, the Holy Spirit. So I simply began to pray and I just said, Lord, what in the world do you mean? And I specifically prayed, Spirit, would you just open up my heart to your word? Would you open your word to my heart? And then I just trusted that God would answer. He said that's what he's going to do. He's trustworthy. He's a promise keeper. So I just began to simply study after I prayed. And I, I pulled out my um, ESV study Bible. Now, regarding this version of the Bible, I tend to teach out of this version. I, th I like the version. I don't like to jump up and down like it's the greatest version on earth. It's a good version of the Bible. I think it's reliable. Uh, but the study Bible that goes along with it is a slam dunk, most amazing thing I have ever come across for studying scripture. It is a resource like no other in one single book. If I could just take one book with me anywhere, and the only book I ever had ever again to study scripture, I feel like I could take this particular book and the what's all is in here. And man, it's, it's good stuff. Okay, so I just got out my study Bible. And I read this section that we're going through today multiple times. Um, and then I did something that some of you might un not understand how to do. Um, if you don't understand how to do it, you can ask somebody who's here who does understand. If you don't know, you can ask me. I'd be happy to help you. Um, but I started to look up cross-references in my Bible. Okay? Like these little things here. These are associated with things that are said in these verses here in verse 12, right? If I look these up, these are verses that go along in other places in the Bible that correlate with what I just read. So I started looking up my cross-references. You, hopefully, almost every single version of the Bible has some limited cross-references to them. Some uh, Bibles have lots more than others. But I started to do that. And I read through those. And then I went back to my study Bible. And... In my study Bible, there's all these notes down here below, right? This is scripture. These are notes, right? I started to read these notes. Now, these notes are not inspired. It's just some guy's thoughts about what scripture means. And you have to hold that in some tension, right? But sometimes um, I read those and, and I get a lot of good insight out of that. However, uh, in this particular time, I didn't find the comments in my study Bible all that helpful. I still didn't understand I didn't feel like I understand. I, I felt like there has to be something more. So then I utilized technology and I uh, got on my, my laptop. I prefer to look on my laptop because it's easier to scroll through and do stuff, but it works on your phone too. I went to Blue Letter Bible and I put in John 17, 22, right? And, and then as I was looking at Blue Letter Bible, they've got this really cool function 
uh, in Blue Letter Bible where you can click on a square and it will give you all the Strong's Concordance references for what all of the words that you're reading mean in either the original Hebrew, if it's the Old Testament, or the original Greek in the New Testament. So I started reading through what in the world does this, first of all, this word for glory, if Jesus says he's given us this glory, what in the world could that mean? What is the word? Well, the, the Greek word for glory here is doxa, okay? And doxa simply means splendor, brightness, majesty is associated with the sun, moon, and stars. Specifically, it's the radiance and majesty of those who belong to God, belonging to Christ, radiating Christ's light in the world. So Jesus says he's given us his glory. And when Jesus is referenced giving us uh, his same glory he received from the Father, certainly it has to have something to do with us as believers having a supernatural radiance associated uh, with being uh, connected to uh, the Lord. Certainly, though, Christ, according to Scripture, does not share the glory of His supremacy with us here on this earth. Jesus Christ, Scripture says, is alone, worthy of all praise, glory, and adoration. Uh, we certainly, Jesus can't mean that He's given us His glory in the same way that He's meaning it in, uh, that we see Him in the book of Revelation, because we certainly don't look like Jesus Christ in His glorified estate. Does anybody see a halo floating around all the people here in the room who've placed their faith in Jesus? Uh, does Chris have fire coming out of her eyes right now? No, she doesn't. Uh, does Eric have a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth for a tongue? No, he doesn't. And yet this is the way Scripture describes Jesus in his glorified estate. So certainly that's for Christ alone. However, this reference to having received Christ's glory is past tense. If you go read it, it's past tense. It can't mean it is impossible for it to mean nothing. It has to be significant. The Apostle Paul spoke about the glory of God given to us in the past tense as well in the book of Romans. Uh, in Romans chapter 8, verse 30, Paul wrote and said, Those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, these he also justified. And those whom he justified, these he also glorified. Okay, past tense. So, if Jesus said that we have his glory, let's exclude the fact that we might not understand what he's saying. If Jesus said that we have his glory, what does that mean? Then we have it. Right? Jesus is not a liar. But what does this glory look like? So that piqued my interest. And I utilized how Blue Letter uh, Bible, the website, provides you with all the different references uh, where this same word, doxa, or glory, um, is used in the entire New Testament. And there's plenty of verses to choose from. There's 168 times in the New Testament where this uh, word is used, 15 times alone in the Gospel of John. Now, I did not sit down and read all 168 uh, references. However, I did do a cursory glance through a bunch of them, certainly read dozens of them, and it uh, certainly <coughs> seemed to begin to reveal a common theme. Now, the reason I want to discuss this with you today is not because I think you need to do or study the Bible in the same way that I study it. I'm only trying to encourage you to study it, and that if you'll study it, the Lord will show up every single time. So afterward, I went and I looked at a couple of uh, online Bible commentaries that I enjoy. Um, I went to A.W. Pink's uh, commentary on the Gospel of John. I also uh, enjoy going to this uh, website, EnduringWord.com. Uh, it's an online commentary of the entire Bible from Pastor David Guzik of Calvary Chapel in Santa Barbara. Um, there's plenty of this stuff to choose from. These just uh, happen to be the two that I personally enjoy. And I wanted to, if I wanted to continue studying a myriad of additional resources, I certainly could have. I mean, we are blessed 
to live right now in this technological age where wonderful, wonderful resources like this are literally at our fingertips if we'll just access them. As a result of this study, uh, here's what I believe I learned and received from the Lord uh, by just simply sitting down as a common human being and saying, Jesus, I don't understand. Would you please help me understand and study his word? First, there must be a connection between the glory of Christ and light. When the glory of God is revealed in Scripture, brilliant light is often attached. So whether it's the glory, uh, whether it was when the glory of the Lord shone round about the shepherds, right, that we celebrate on Christmas night uh, from Luke 2.9, or whether it was Moses and Elijah when they're uh, appearing with Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration and all three of them are glowing, uh, which we read about in Matthew 17, there tends to be a connection between the glory of the Lord, the glory of Christ, and light. So even though uh, we never will fully display the glory of Christ here on earth with the same amount of glory Christ did, there must be, there must be a way for us to radiate His light in this world gone dark. Hold your spot wherever you're at in Scripture, hopefully John. Hold your spot there. Flip to the book of Hebrews. If you've got uh, your Bible, let your fingers do the walking. Flip there. Get there. Scroll there. Whatever you got to do. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. Says this about Jesus and God's glory and light. The author of Hebrews wrote and said, Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He, meaning Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of His nature. So Jesus is the what? He is the radiance of what? The glory of God. The doxa of God. He's the radiance of the glory of God. If we are, you and me, as believers, to display the glory of God, then we need to be faithful to point other people to Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the radiance of the glory of God. Period. Uh, when our words... Uh, connected together with our behavior, direct other people to Jesus, then the glory of Christ is on display in us. Every single time. Why does that happen? Well, it's because Jesus, as the radiance of the glory of God, is the light of the what? Oh, He's the light of the world. Uh, go back to the Gospel of John. Flip there. John chapter 8, verse 12. Put your own eyes on it. Jesus spoke to them and He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows Me will not walk in darkness, but will have what? Okay, you follow Jesus. He's the light of the world. You follow Jesus. You will not walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. Period. Jesus is the light of the world, the glory of God on display. Whoever follows Him will not walk in darkness, but they will have the light of life instead. So much light. Pay close attention. Please pay, uh, pay close attention. So much light that Jesus said the same thing about us as He said about Himself. We're in John. Go back to Matthew chapter 5. Everybody go. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Listen to the words of Jesus about you as a follower of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. 
Jesus says this about you. If you've placed your faith in him as the light of the world, he said about you, you are what? Oh, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on its stand so that it can give light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and give what? And give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So here we see Jesus used the same language to describe himself as he used to describe his own disciples. Jesus is the light of the world. If we follow Jesus, then we become the conduits of Jesus' light in this world as well. Jesus is like the bright noonday sun. There's just one. Okay? There's none like him. But when we encounter Christ and we begin to live like Christ, we become, please pay attention, we become like vessels that carry his light out into the world around us. Jesus is the sun and we are lamps holding the power of the sun within them. Now I want to revisit briefly uh, what Jesus said just a few moments ago uh, here in, back in the book of John. Go to John chapter 14. This is just a few, it's probably an hour, maybe a couple hours beforehand. Jesus said this same statement to his disciples about the power of God within us as believers. Jesus here speaking about the Holy Spirit said, I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells what? With you. With you. That's like this. He dwells with you like we're with each other in the room right now. And he will be where? Jesus is the light of the world and Jesus, by faith in him for the forgiveness of my sins, he lives where? So I carry within me the light of the world. Okay? You following? Now, everybody start flipping to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to start out in verses 1 through 6. But Christ, according to Scripture dwells somehow supernaturally within us through the power of his Holy Spirit. So that is the light of the world dwelling inside us like broken clay pots. It's amazing. This brings us to how the glory of Christ can shine out of us. Paul is going to speak to us about that right now. He's writing in his second letter to the believers in Corinth. Please pay attention. It's so good. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we don't lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful and underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. Going back to last week, the word of God is powerful. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with it. God's word is living and active. We're just going to simply teach it and let God's word do what God's word does. We're simply going to study it as believers in Jesus Christ and we're going to let God's word transform us. We're not going to tamper. We're not going to play games. We're just going to study it. But by the open statement of faith, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel or good news is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing Listen, verse 4, in their case, the God of this world, that's Satan, has blinded the minds of believers. For what purpose? To keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Satan is 100% convinced that if you are faithful to expose yourself to this book, your life will be forever altered. You can't continue to expose yourself to this book and not be changed. It's not possible. How convinced is it? Jesus, when he's speaking about uh, the parable of the sower and the seed, do you remember the, the parable? There's the four types of soil. The first type of soil is the, is the road pan, right? It's the hard pan heart. 
right? And he says that the seed is God's word. And do you remember why he said uh, the birds come and snatch the seed away from the hard pan heart? And he says that the seed is, or the, the birds are a representation of the devil. Do you remember why that was? Huh? He says, because if it were allowed to remain, it would bear fruit. Even on the roadway. It's so powerful. So Satan, he, he blinds. Doesn't want you to see that. Why? Because the glory of Christ, he is the image of God. Verse 5, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said what? What did God say? Let light shine out of the darkness has shown where? He's shown in our hearts to give light to the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Again, through just taking the time to just read and study God's Word, the Spirit who lives within us, He begins to remove the veil from our eyes. We see more of Christ's glory. The light of the world shines into the heart of believers. For what purpose? Why does God want to shine His light in the hearts of believers? It's so that His light... Listen... Don't lose this. This is so important. Okay? It's so that His light can begin to shine out of us for the purpose of drawing other people to Himself. Paul continues. This gets real good. Paul continues, verse 7. All right. But we... But we, speaking to believers, have this treasure. What treasure? Oh, the glory of Christ. But we have this treasure in what? Or jars of clay. Common pottery. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Listen, we are afflicted in every way. Not crushed, perplexed, not driven to despair, persecuted, not forsaken, struck down, not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Jars of clay are fragile, aren't they? Easily broken. They're simple to shatter. But what kind of containers possess the glory of Christ? Jars of clay. And we're certainly broken, aren't we? We've been afflicted. We've been afflicted by the consequences of sin done by us. We've been broken by sin done to us. We've been scarred by sin done around us. And we're left like cracked pots. Unusable. Unless. Unusable unless the Creator intervenes and restores. And Jesus does. He intervenes. Jesus intercedes. Jesus renews. Jesus restores. Now, what does the restoration that Christ does within us look like and how in the world does that restoration allow us to radiate His glory as broken vessels in a world gone dark? We're going to take a quick trip, uh, trip to Japan for just a moment. And I'm going to drop a Japanese word on you, and it's kintsugi. Okay? This is a really interesting, unique form of Japanese art where they put pieces of broken pottery back together. And do you want to know what they use to seal the pottery with? Precious metal, often gold. 
Now, one of the world's most famous kintsugi artists, he just happens to be a lover of Jesus, a really outspoken lover of Jesus. His name is uh, Makoda Fujimura. You can look up interviews uh, on this guy on YouTube. He's outspoken about how the beauty of Kintsugi is a metaphor for displaying the glory of Christ and how the glory of Christ is free and liberated to radiate out of broken vessels, redeemed vessels like us. I think it's interesting because we're reading here in John 17 about how Jesus is praying for everybody who's going to come to believe in him. And at that point, when Jesus is praying, he's not just praying uh, for Jeremiah Van Horn. He's also praying for Makoda Fujimura. Now, check this out. Here's some examples of Kintsugi. There's a broken pot mended by gold. There's another jar of clay mended by gold. Somebody dropped that bowl on the floor, all's lost. No, it's not. You look at your life, and you're like, I'm so broken. I'm such a mess. Nobody could put the pieces of Humpty Dumpty back together again for me. Oh, yes, he can. Yes, he can, and when he gets done, he'll mend you with gold. It's a vivid illustration of how the glory of Christ has been given to us and it's displayed. His glory is revealed through suffering, through brokenness, and then he steps in to restore it. Uh, Each of these vessels is redeemed with gleaming gold. It radiates gold. It's a beautiful illustration of the light of the world leaking out of our brokenness so that others, other broken vessels, might be drawn to the master potter that did that for you. Paul continued in verse 16. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. We don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away. That's your clay pot broken. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. We're pieced back together by Christ with gold. Then he says, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. We end up of far more value in our redeemed estate than we ever had to begin with. As we look, verse 18, not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. The things that are seen are transient. The things that are unseen are eternal. Now, Go to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. We're going to reread Matthew 5, uh, and we'll be in verses uh, 15 through 16 again. Where Jesus just called us the light of the world. Listen to what Jesus said. He says something really interesting in regards to the glory of God. Nor do people light a lamp when they put it under a basket, but on a stand it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and then do what? Give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So the glory of Christ has been given to us as clay pots for what purpose? According to Christ, it's so that our good works will give glory to Right? To the Father in heaven. So specifically, what is one good work that we can do that God uses to display His glory? Jesus has been speaking about it at length, all in John chapter 17. And it is the work of dwelling in unity. That we would be one as He is one. I'm, I'm really thankful that when Jesus spoke about the issue of unity that he used the word work. Because it is, if we're honest. 
Living together in unity with other people is, is work. But when we come together and we desire to live in unity with each other and we begin to strive to work past our faults and value each other and utilize the spiritual gifts that Christ has provided us, then the glory of God is truly on display to a world that is watching. They are looking on from the dark. Verse 23, back in John 17, Jesus continued to pray. And He said, I and them and you and me that they may be perfectly one, so that the world may know that you've sent me and love them even as you've loved me. People don't often speak about this, including myself, but unity within the body of Christ is actually a non-negotiable facet of living for Christ. We don't get around to the idea of unity and go, well, that's optional. I don't like that person, so I don't have to... It's not spoken of like that. Jesus recognized the difficulty of this particular principle in our sinful lives. Um, I didn't look it up, but um, who here has the New International Version? Anybody reads out of that? Okay, cool. A few of you? Great. I love how the New International Version translates this verse that we just read. What it says in the New International Version, Jesus said, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought, that they may be brought, that they may be brought to complete Unity. Then the world will know that you've sent me and you've loved them even as you've loved me. Listen, if we're honest, we have to be brought to unity, right? Because left to our own devices, we're not going to achieve it because we're just inherently selfish people. All of us. We just are. So for this to happen in the church today, it would take a powerful move of the Holy Spirit. But... Who has been given to us? We have everything we need. He gave us His Spirit. He's made His home in our hearts. We have the power to love one another and live in unity. Not only is unity achievable according to Scripture, uh, but according to Jesus Christ, it's an extremely powerful witness to a watching world. Jesus said, if we will love one another um, and be unified, that many unbelievers will come to believe in Jesus Christ for themselves. Why? Well, because it's so powerful. Why is it so powerful? Have you ever paused to consider that the world has zero examples of humanity dwelling in true unity outside of Christ? This happens because we're naturally selfish. We're self-centered individuals. We're human beings, and we've always been at each other's throats. The most... The two most perfect human beings who ever lived were Adam and Eve. Correct? They're as close to God as you can possibly get. Correct? Okay, they sinned one time. One time only. And the the sin, if you go back and look, all they did was take the cookie out of the cookie jar. That was the first sin. God said, don't have this cookie. They said, no, we're going to have it. Immediately after, Adam blames who? Eve, and he blames God too, if you go back and read it. And then Eve blames the serpent. And then they have two boys. And Cain does what with his younger brother Abel? Murders him. And on and on and on and on and on and on it goes. If you go back and you honestly look at history, there are no examples. I don't care how sanitized we try to make things in the past. You know, sometimes we'll be like, uh, people will be like, Oh, you know, if it was everything was just like dances with wolves and we could all just live, live in our little uh, native estate, you know. Man, you go back and you read what went on. Not only among the tribe, but tribe to tribe. We've had series in the world multiple times and we're trying to head there again as the United States like a bunch of dummies. But... We've had multiple times in this world where we're like, we can achieve nirvana here on this earth as human beings outside of God. We will have our perfect social communist estate apart from God. And how do those experiments end every single time? With the slaughter of millions of people. 
This is why if Christians will just begin to live in unity with one another, the world who's sitting over there in the dark and they're watching and they're like, what in the world is going on over there? They have something I don't have. Do you understand me? God wants us to live in unity. Verse 24, Jesus continued and he prayed, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus longs. He's in heaven right now. We know, right? He's back with the Father. He's seated at the Father's right hand according to Scripture. He's interceding for you. And while He's interceding for you, according to what Jesus just prayed, He's longing for you and me to be where? Now, we can understand this. This is one thing that we can understand really quickly. Do you have somebody that you know loves Jesus and they've passed from this life to the next? They've switched addresses and their mortal body gave out and they've gone to be with the Lord? Does your heart ever ache to be reunited with them? Listen, I, if I'm honest, I, I think about it fairly frequently. I wouldn't say it's every week, but it's certainly multiple times a month where it'll pass through my mind. It's like, man, I miss my grandpa. Man, I miss my grandma. It'd be so good to see my grandfather face to face again and be able to embrace. It'd be so good to see my grandmother again and be able to embrace. Listen, listen. Jesus is in heaven right now. And his heart, not like, it's not heartache like we think of like sadness, but he's longing. It's like, man, I'm so ready to give Robert a hug. I wish Robert was with me. I wish Casey was with me. I wish Angela was with me. Man, I'm looking forward to the day when Darren Jones' body wears out and I can just embrace him. That's cool. It's so good. He wants us to be with him forever. Verse 25 O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, that these and these know that you've sent me. And multiple times here in the gospel, we won't belabor the point, but multiple times the disciples have realizations where they begin to understand, yes, Jesus, you are the Son of God. Do they understand it perfectly? No, they don't. We're going to see what's going to happen to them here in just a moment when we get into John 18 and they abandon Jesus. But they do get it. They do believe and it's genuine, and Jesus is thankful. Verse 26. Jesus closes out his prayer, and he said, I made known to them your name, and I will make it known that the love with, with which you have given, with which you have loved me, may be in them, and I in them. Jesus' ultimate purpose for every single one of us is not just to save us from our sin. That's what he needed to do to accomplish what he really wanted to do, which is that we would be reunited with the Father. Back to Eden all over again. Reunite it. Reminded me of the cheesy song. Reunite it, and it feels so good, right? Reunite it because we understood there's one perfect fit, and sugar, this one is it. We are both so excited because we're reunited. Hey, hey. Man, reunite it. God is excited for us to be reunited. How in the world can this possibly be? How in the world could God want all of that with us? Well, it's not rocket science. For God, so what? He loves you. And when he's apart from you, he misses you. I just left this last week and I had to go up to Portland just for 
uh, three days, two nights, and I was apart from Danielle to go to this conference. And initially, she was supposed to get to come, but her and Tobias were sick, so they stayed away. And I'm in Portland, I'm you know across the state, and I'm away from my wife, and when I'm not completely submerged in everything else that's going on, and the moment I get a free moment to think, where do you think my heart goes? Back home. Back home. Why? Because I love my wife. I love my son. I love my son. I love our daughter. I got to stop in and say hi to her. I love our daughter-in-law. And I miss them when I'm not with them. He loves you. And he has empowered you to mature and to become disciples uh, so that other people might come to know. He wants his light, his glory to shine out of your brokenness so that other people would look and go, wow, that's amazing. I want some. It's not rocket science. Father, thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you that it's alive, it's living, it's active, it's that all by itself. If we'll just simply read it and study it. And Lord, thank you that somehow through the power of your Holy Spirit, you live within us, Lord, and your light mends us from the inside out, just like the gold here in Kintsugi. And Lord, it's there to radiate to other people that they too might come to understand and believe. And Lord, I just pray that we would just do it. That we would just radiate for you. Not because we're perfect, Lord, we're broken, but we're mended by the perfect potter. We're mended by the master artist. And Lord, where you have mended us and are mending us, oh, it displays the glory of God like crazy. We give you thanks and praise, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Uh, Before we dismiss this morning, we're going to take some time to take communion together. If I could have uh, Jason and Ryan come up, if you would. For communion today, um, this is one time, well, there's lots of times, but this is another time when I'm thankful that we have a moment um, where we can just pause and reflect and remember and be silent. What I'm going to do today in an effort to just keep this simple Not simple because we need to gloss it over or hurry through it, but simple because sometimes it's just healthy for us to pause and remember how simple things really ought to be. We're going to uh, pass out the elements of communion to you. If you could hang on to them when you get them. And then all I'm going to do is read a passage from Scripture um, regarding communion, and we'll take it together. But... While you receive it, if you're here and you've placed your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin, I would love it um, if you would just be silent. That we wouldn't visit. That we wouldn't be distracted. If you need to, just close your eyes. And let's just sit. Let's remember what Jesus did so that we can be filled with the glory of God. Um, Jason, you want to pray for communion?